provide and some of the results um, the client was able to uh, get as a result of um, some of our recommendations on this. So um, since 2016, this topic has been trending. I mean, it's been on a lot of SPE papers, I'm talking about fracture-driven inter inter interference. And uh, we did a couple of digging in you know, with IHS data and data that's available publicly to really try and quantify um, the impact of um, fracture-driven interference and on parent wells and on infill wells or child wells. So I'll be using infill wells, child wells interchangeably. Um, so based on IHS data and public data, we're able to actually figure out that um, about 64% of uh, parent wells actually uh, experience negative frac hits. And with the increasing trend of infill wells that are drilled now of about 60%, this is a major concern. Because in a lot of the basins across the U.S., we're in full development mode, whether it's even in, in the Williston Basin, the back end, if it's in Eagle Ford, you know, in Permian, I mean, there's, there's an increasing trend of we're going real hard, we're producing these reserves, and um, this, is a trending, this is a trending issue, and how are we going to be able to combat these kinds of factor-driven interactions that actually affect these parent wells negatively? And then even in terms of production loss, we've seen up to 50% production loss in these parent wells, which is also, you know, also leaving a lot of money on the table as well. And then when we get into the infill wells, uh, 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 when we look into the infill wells, we actually do see that despite the fact that we're going really aggressive on our completion designs, right? I mean, we're going really, we're applying new technologies, we're doing things efficiently, we still figure out that even the child wells are still um, underperforming, you know, by 20%. When we compare the propent loading, you know, we're going, pumping a lot of propent, but despite that, we're still not seeing increased productivity in these infill wells. And then the next thing we see also is the fact that for this, uh, when we compare the production um, potential of the child wells and the parent wells, we're seeing about 40% deduction in the newly drilled wells. So what we're saying is with all the new technologies we're improving, the way we do things, you know, on the field efficiently, we're getting better in our, we understand what the production drivers are. Um, with time, even as we're drilling these infill wells, we're still seeing that these infill wells actually underperform compared to parent wells that were already uh, pre-existing. So as a result of that, um, you know, we had to think of a way, okay, how are we going to be able to address this challenge? And before I, I go into, you know, some of the solutions, I just want to highlight a few things, and you know, when I say fracture-driven inter interactions, the one thing that we see that can be an adverse effect to the parent wells that are already pre-existing, they're already producing, they're already online, is what we call a frac hit, right? And uh, usually what we define this as is a situation where we have a direct interaction between the parent and infill wells. Um, in this picture right here, um, if you look at this picture on the, on the uh, right hand side, you see that this is a, a parent well. This is a parent well right here. Um, this parent well has been drilled, it's been completed, been producing for a couple of years. And in blue in the background really would be the original stress conditions of that reservoir. And with time, as we produce and deplete the reservoir, you notice that, of course, the pressure is going to reduce. You're going to have reduced reservoir pressure. And the fractures we create also um, is also, also um, connoted in black here, the fractures, the hydraulic fractures we create during a stimulation job, just to make sure that you know, everyone's versed in that. So we have all that here. We have a depleted state of reservoir in the parent well. And then you know, whether it's six months later or a year later, or a couple of years later, we come back and we want to drill an infill well or a child well, whether it's 800 feet, 1,000 feet away from the parent well, um, and, and, and as a result of this, all these lines here, these are stages, you know, dep depicted this green, blue, these are all depicted by stages. And as a result, you know, a fracture could occur in a situation whereby, you know, for example, we have a particular stage here, right? And we know we have five clusters. These clusters are pretty much conduits that have perforations that would, where, we would uh, um, where we would perform the stimulation job through, right? We pump the fluid, the propent from the top of the, of the well, and it flows down to the lateral. 
and it goes through the clusters. So in a perfect situation where we know that we have a homogeneous reservoir, which means that the stress properties and the formation properties are, are homogeneous across the lateral, we would expect that all the clusters will take in fluid, right? So you have all the clusters activated, they're all taken in fluid, and as a result, we have an idea of what a uniform fracture, we know we're gonna have a uniform fracture geometry, right, because we have equal volume of fluid and prop and flowing through each of the clusters. But in a lot of the situations in unconventionals, we see that a lot of times these clusters are not all activated. You start the job and only some of the clusters, the preparations are taking in fluid, and as a result of that, you then have you know, all these long fractures, right, that are going and could possibly um, interact directly with the parent well you know, in this situation here. And as well, this is also showing the same thing where you also have three clusters and you, know, you have you know, non-uniform fracture growth across the clusters as a result of this. So this is what we call a, a frac heat where you have a direct interaction. And typically, you know, if you have a pressure gauge on this, you'd actually be able to see a response you know, on the pressure monitored on these runaway fractures from the infill wells um, to the parent wells. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But um, this is pretty much a plot just showing some work that uh, we had done, um, looking at fracking occurrence, looking at some um, statistics. And you can see in the back end, not all frac hits are negative, right? Some can be positive in that you may not necessarily see a production degradation in the parent well, and the infill well may still be able to produce up to par. But in the back end, we see about 50% of the frackets we see are positive, but there are 15% that are negative, right? And then you see that that changes across as you go through the, the different basins, right? And the negative, the, the, um, the other number would be neutral, like, you know, if it's not positive, if it's not negative, then it would be neutral, which means you don't see any impact at all. So one of the ways we wanted to um, address this problem was, you know, first thing we need to do is to try and optimize the design. You know, how are we able to optimize the completion design, the stimulation design on the infill well, you know, to ensure that we are addressing the reservoir uniqueness and understanding how the hydraulic fracture is going to propagate to ensure that we avoid frac hits. The next thing we want to do is how are we going to ensure that all the perforation clusters are evenly taken in fluid and we don't have a situation where we have just some clusters taken in fluid and you, you have runaway fracture growth which could potentially hit the parent well. And then the last but not the least was to also address far field, far field, uh, uh, far field um, um, stance whereby we're able to even further prevent the fracture growth from running away or you know, causing adverse effect to the parent well. So all these are all fracture geometry technologies that we're, I'm going to be talking about, fracture geometry control technologies that I'm going to be talking about as well. So to address all these challenges that I just highlighted, um, these are the proposed solutions. Um, I'm gonna talk about the design optimization first. So for design optimization, the first thing is we need to understand our reservoir. We need to understand what the key, uh, what the, what, how, how the, the reservoir properties changes across the lateral, right? We need to be able to understand how, what kind of hydraulic fracture growth uh, we're creating, right? And we have models, we have state-of-the-art technology models, software models that do enable us to be able to, um, to, be able to um, um, input data, data, reservoir data that's key in making us able to predict and optimize the completion design and performance of these infill wells. Another key thing that we've seen to help with design optimization real time is real time pressure monitoring. If we're able to monitor the real time, the pressure, if we're able to monitor pressure real time, that's going to enable us to be able to observe and identify if we do have frac hits on the parent wells real time. And that way we can make changes on the fly to the design job on the infill wells to ensure that we don't have those frac hits. The next thing we want to address is the near wall bore piece. For the near wall board piece, how do we ensure we have you know, improved perforation efficiency that all the perforations are easily taken fluid equally and there is no um, fracture on the way growth to the offset to the parent wells. And then we also have the far field as well, which further helps us prevent fracture. So we have the far field fracture geometry control. So all these solutions are, are all that we're able to, um, all these solutions are all we're proposing you know, to be able to effectively um, be able to avoid some of these factors that we've seen and the negative consequences. 
And um, now I'm gonna go into the case studies we were able to deploy in the Williston Basin. And we did this uh, for a client uh, called Lime Rock Resources. So I'm gonna go back in 2018, this client, Lime Rock, came to us and said, we have a couple of parent wells in the past which we have had on production for a while and we had adverse effects whereby we saw frack hits to our parent wells. And we don't want that happening. We don't want to knock our parents' well offline. One of the key things they observed was they were getting sand in from the infill well into the parent wells. And what that would require is that would require them to do a clean out, you know, which would cost them a couple of, I mean, a couple of hundreds uh, of, of dollars, thousand dollars to be able to uh, do the clean out. And then we have the defect production as well as a result of that. So this was a, a major, uh, issue for them, so they wanted to mitigate that. Uh, that that they wanted to mitigate that from happening. You know, how are they going to be able to mitigate negative well interference on the parent well? So here we have a test pad, and the idea here was to, you know, it was the first time the client was going to do this or deploy our technologies in this way. So you know, they wanted to go a little bit conservative, right? So they had a pad, have a pad here where you have a three wells, you have a parent well right here in the middle, and then you, we had a child well, number two, which was only 800 feet away from the parent well, and then we had another well, um, well number three, which is 1,300 feet away uh, from the parent well. So the parent well had been in production for at least seven years before the infill wells came in. So, I mean, you know, the, re the results were, were almost on a depleted state, but at the same time, you had, you know, a pressure sink for sure around um, the parent well, and I've highlighted some SPE papers here because all this work is published. So if you want to, you know, get more details, you are definitely ready. You are more than welcome to read those papers. But as a result of the pressure depletion in the parent well, after seven years of production, we'd expect a pressure sink, right? A pressure sink around the parent well. Now we have reservoir models that are able to help us predict, you know, what that pressure sink would be, and if we are able to uh, place this infill wells here, how the stimulation of the infill wells would um, impact the parent well, you know, and all. Because the fracture will always go in the path of least resistance. So there's possibility of, you know, where you have um, um, a little bit of, um, a little bit of um, um, preference, you know, of fracture growth towards the parent well as opposed to this to the other side of the well. So for, in this case, you know, we're, of course the client was most concerned about well number two because it was the closest to the parent well, right? And we're able to deploy all these different solutions to the client, the near orbit diversion, which I mentioned, the far field diversion, and the real-time monitoring of the parent well, as well as doing some prior work with the modeling software to be able to optimize the fracture treatment on the child wells. So here, this is how we're able to implement technology. We co collaborated with the client and uh, we decided that the best way to go about it would be for well number three, since this well is 1,300 feet away from the parent well, we would go ahead and pump the near orbit diverter, right? That's the diverter that would help to ensure that all the perforation clusters are open, are active. So all these lines here represent the perforation clusters. And then on the parent well, we're gonna have a high pressure high frequency pressure monitoring gauge on the parent well to be able to actually monitor the pressure, right? To see if we're seeing frack hits and if we can actually mitigate it. And then well number two is one that we were able to deploy the near orbit diverter to ensure that all the perforation clusters were open. But we took a unique strategy here because since I, like, this was kind of like a pilot test, so the client wanted us to pump the near orbit diverter to ensure all perforation clusters are open in the first couple of stages, right? And then the next five stages, we pumped the far field diverter along with the near orbit diverter. And then in the subsequent stages, we only pumped the near orbit diverter and we continued that sequence along the well bore. And the idea here was to be able to help us really understand, you know, how these different technologies were performing based on the uh, pressure that we're monitoring on the offset well. So here is the modeling software diversion design strategy. I just wanted to highlight, just you know, just to highlight what we did um, here. This first uh, uh, plot is showing the sand concentration, right, versus the fluid. So this is the pump schedule, pretty much, and it shows the kinds of propellant we're pumping, right. 
We pump 100 mesh in the beginning st st steps of the, the pump schedule. We follow it with a 40, 70 mesh. And then right in the middle is where we pump the near rubber diverter. So the near rubber diverter consists of tetramodal sized particles with fiber that actually help divert the fluid. So for instance, we start pumping the job and you have a situation where only a couple of clusters, two clusters are taking in fluid, right? So we pump the near rubber diverter to help plug up those initial clusters that are taking in fluid. Once we do that, then we're able to build enough pressure, direct the fluid into the other sets of clusters that are not taking in fluid. So that's why you can see that here, this pump schedule is pretty much split into two parts, right? First part, we divert, initiate into new set of preparations, and then we pump the rest of the job. That was for well design three. Well designed to, like I mentioned, we pump the far field diverter, which would be the broadband shield, and then we pump the near rubber diverter in the middle, and then the broadband shield. So the difference between well three and well two is that we pump the broadband shield, the far field diverter, which is also a fracture geometry control pill. Uh, it only consists of two different particles this time and a special set of fibers. But in this case, what it does is it helps bridge the fracture at the fracture tip. And the fibers also help create that perm, high perm plug, uh, low perm plug, so that we prevent the fracture from going any further. And then some of the key things that we use in the diversion strategy, in the modeling strategy, is to use some of the software models to be able to understand what kind of fracture geometry we are creating with the far field diverter case. And here you can see with the no far field diverter, we're showing a, a half length of the fracture about 15, 70 feet. And then with the broadband, with the far field diverter, we're showing a reduced uh, uh, length of the fracture geometry. So that's kind of how, the, the, that's, that's the mechanism to which we are able to arrest the fracture tip propagation to prevent the fracture from um, running away to hit the offset well. And this is just uh, some of the other models that we use as well. Um, these are all software models. So as a result of that, we were able to go to the field, we executed the job as we planned, and we were able to actually quantify the results. And here, what I'm showing here is some of the results we got from well three. Remember well three was the well that was, 12, that was um, about 1,800 feet away, and that well, we only pumped the near rubber diverter, and we did see 61% of the stages, we noticed that there were frac hits to the parent well in 61% of the stages, right, where we pumped near rubber diverter. So the point here is that even if well number three was about 1,800 feet away, we still observed that 61% of the stages still communicated with the parent well. And then well number two here, for the stages where we pumped only the near rubber diverter, we saw 42% of the stages that interacted with the parent well. But what we wanted to highlight here is that the stages in well two, which was closer to the, to the parent well, where we pumped both near rubber diverter and the far field diverter, we saw no stages that communicated with the parent well. So that was really key for us because what this was telling us is that these, all these technologies, they go hand in hand and we have to deploy, we have to deploy them together. They don't work single handedly. So to get the best effective result would be to deploy both of those technologies. And the interesting thing is that because of this, the parent well, the client did not have any well bore sand in the parent well, and they were able to save their cleanup cost of about $400,000, which was also including deferred production, which they would have had to account for if there was a clean out. And overall, there was about 50, the infill well production comparison compared to the other offsets around the area those of this wall number two and wall number three actually performed about 56% better. And this is normalized with, with lateral length and prop and volume for those um, infill wells. So the client was very pleased with this. So as a result, when we're done with the pilot test, they said, okay, you know what, why don't we take this to a full campaign? As you know, in the back end and in lots of unconventional plays in the US now, we're looking at a lot of stacked laterals. We're, we're, we're trying to, um, to, to develop multilaterals you know, on a pad, and this even makes it more complicated. So they came to us and said, okay, this worked initially, now let's give you guys a more complicated problem, right? 
So here in this case, you can see that we have red wells. These wells in red are all the, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize that, yeah, it's, that, that wasn't that way. I don't know why it's showing up there now, but um, I was just trying to explain it as best as I can. So the red wells, you can see these wells. These wells are all drilled in the middle backing. And these wells were drilled and completed between 2010 and 2015. You see how they go diagonal? And then in 2017, the client came and drilled this parent well here as well, which is offset well number seven. They drilled this well here as well in red. And then in 2019, they came to us and said, we want to drill two pads in between these, these wells. And, and um, we want you to come up with a, a strategy on how we're able to ensure that even if we complete these wells, this well number two is going to be only 800 feet from the offset well number seven. The next well is going to be 1,400 feet in addition. And well number three and we know what number four how are we going to ensure that all these parent wells do not have any adverse effect? Um, you know, there's no adverse effect of, of the simulation of the infill wells on the parent wells, right? So that was their main objective. And they wanted to ensure also that we're able to maintain the infill well, the offset, the parent well production, which I would also call the offset wells. And they wanted to make sure that we're going to be able to optimize the infill well production, which is these new wells right here. So you can see this was a very complex case because the, uh, the, the, the actual infill wells to be drilled, all the child wells were landed in the three forks, which is only about 60 feet above the wells that run diagonal that are landed in the middle back end. So the client was not only concerned about height growth, right, and ensuring that we don't knock these wells in the middle back end out offline, they were also concerned too, as well, about the other well that runs parallel, right, to these, of, to these infill wells, because especially for the fact that you had well number two here, which was only 800 feet away from a well that had been producing for about two years. So this was, this was a very complex case for them. But we were able to sit down together and come up with a, a strategy. And before we did that, we wanted to, established the fact that, um, that it's likely there was going to be some sort of communication, right, La both laterally and in terms of height growth. So the next thing we wanted to do was, remember I mentioned design optimization, that's the first step. So we took it into a software, right, where we're able to model the fracture growth. And here, these are some of the reservoir properties that we had from a pilot log, from an offset well, a gamma ray, this is showing Poisson's ratio, some of the mechanical rock properties that are really key for us to be able to understand fracture growth. And here I'm showing uh, an initiation point, all these in the three forks, and I picked an initiation point in the three forks uh, B2 and an initiation point in the three forks B1. And here, um, if we're initiating in the three forks B2, uh, we have the first track here, we're showing a no depletion case, which means that what we try to do was to account for um, uh, the, the pressure depletion, which we would expect to see um, in the back end, because the back end had been producing for a number of years. And as a result of that, you see this first column here is showing the fracture geometry, just like from a gun barrel view. And you see that the fracture stays pretty, um, with no depletion in this case, with no depletion in the back end, which means that the stress conditions are in its original state, you see that the fracture stays pretty contained in three forks. We go to the next column here showing a depleted case where we account for depletion in the back end, and you see that there is height growth into the back end. So here we're establishing the fact that it's likely with depletion in those offset parent wells, we're likely going to be growing into the back end, which the client didn't want. And then when we go to initiation point number two, you see that even in a no depletion state, in a depletion state, you still see fracture growth into the back end. So this established the fact that we wanted to really get an understanding instead of just, you know, guessing. We wanted to use the, real t the data we had, reservoir data, to be able to buttress the fact that it's likely we're going to be hitting the three, the back in wells that were already completed and how do we mitigate that? So the next thing we wanted to do was, okay, how do we actually even design 
the far field that better. So we're not just like throwing products down hole. We're actually trying to understand, you know, how we're going to be able to limit, um, you know, the fracture hydraulic length and the height growth. So we have a state of the art technology, a state of the art software that we're able to also use. And in this case, we're showing a case where we had no far field diverter. And you see the half length we were able to get was in the range of 837 feet. And if you remember, the well that, that the offset well that, that, was that, that we were concerned about that was completed in 2017 was only 800 feet away from well number two, from one of the well infill wells. So this already tells us that it's likely we're going to have communication laterally as well. And then we went on with some other cases where we included a base design of the far field diverter to see what, how that would affect, affect the fracture geometry. And we also looked at looking at the base design considering also with less pad, 20% less pad. Pad is just pretty much the stage, the step fluid that we pump in the beginning of the pump schedule. And then we also looked at another base design with 40% less pad as well. And then we went with a less aggressive, a more aggressive design of the far field diverter. But the bottom line is with all these different um, scenarios that we looked at, we did see that we could successively reduce the fracture geometry growth um, as we went more aggressive in the design, we could evidently see it in the model. So what that enabled us to do was to be able to come up with a strategy to be able to take to the field, whereby, you know, we have different contingency cases, right? So the first thing we're able to do was to say, okay, for well number one and well number two, which are the infill wells on pad one, I'm going to be focused on pad one, which is closer to the well the horizontal well that was um, just 800 feet away, we were going to pump far field diverter, right? We're going to pump far field diverter on stages 2 to 24, and then with two, the well number 2, which is the well that was only 800 feet away from the other horizontal, we're going to pump far field diverter on all the stages. But on this wells, we pumped near warbler diverter on all the wells, right? So that's a standard procedure for the clients. Remember, near warbler diverter is for perforation efficiency. Far field diverter is to help us uh, bridge at the fracture tip to enable us to um, prevent fracture growth, runaway fracture growth. So as a result, we're able to come up with these different contingencies. We said if we did see a frag hit on the parent well, you know, we're going to start with a base design, with a full pad volume, with a certain uh, volume uh, uh, mass of the diverter peel. But if we still see a frag hit, this is what we're going to do. If we still see a frack here, this is what we're going to do. So this is one of the real good things of having that real-time pressure monitoring because what that does is it helps us to be able to actually optimize the job on the fly, real-time. You know, we don't have to wait till after the fact. We can, we, can, uh, we, can, we can make changes on the next stages as we go based on what we observe. And this is pretty much a similar plot to what I showed earlier where we pumped the near warbler diverter in blue in the middle, right, to make sure we're increasing our perforation efficiency, and then we pump the far field diverter, you know, in the beginning of the treatment. Okay, so for some reason, the, the color is, is not coming out the way I, I, you know, I had it in the presentation, but pretty much this is info well number one. Info well number one is a well that, that was 2,200 feet away uh, from, the, um, from the parent well. And in this case, if you see yellow, if you see blue, green, yellow and green, which means that we didn't see any frack hit, frack hit will be indicated by red. So the frack hit will be where, in this case, we had a criteria where if we saw a pressure spike of 30, p uh, of a pressure spike of 250 PSI over the course of the stage, or a rate of five PSI per minute increase on the, on the uh, pressure on the offset well, we would classify that as a frack hit. And this is all based on our experience and so on the prior work we had done on how we're able to call off those cutoffs, right? So here in well number one, remember well number one was only 2,200 feet away, was about 2,200 feet away from the other uh, parallel horizontal well, and there was no frack hits observed here. If we go to well number two, remember well number two was the well that was only 800 feet away from the, uh, the parent well that was parallel. And you'd notice that there are some, I'm sorry, I don't know why the colors are not coming out right, but here we also have yellow, green, and red. So the, the stages that show red, that is where we had frackets. We observed we had frackets. So in this well, yes, 
we're showing that it's 800 feet away and we still had fractures. You can see that it kind of builds up in stage eight, then stage 12, 13, 14, we start to see it. And as a result of that, we decided, okay, we need to do something different. We need to go more aggressive on the far field diverter. And we did that. And once we did that, we were able to see on the parent world that the pressure stabilized with the aggressive far field diverter after we had even used some of the other contingency plans we had. So this was able to show that we were able to visually see and quantify the fact that as we went aggressive on the far field diverter, we're actually able to see that there was a reduction in the frequency and the severity of the frack hits to the parent wells. So once the job was completed, then we were able then to now really look at the production results because we must not forget production because that's one of the key things um, the client uses as a way of really being able to quantify if we were able to achieve our objectives. So this is the production results of the parent wells and we have parent well, all the, the parent wells here. Remember those wells that were diagonally across, landed in the back end. So I'm showing that here. So this is all production on the y-axis time. And this is the last four months before the infill well frack, right? You can see the wells were producing maybe 50 barrels a day. And we shot in the well, those wells. Those wells that were diagonally across, we didn't monitor them. We just shot them in, put a plug on them while we stimulated the infill wells. So you can see that four months after the infill well refract, you see that we actually didn't have any adverse effect of production. Instead, we saw a production uplift on those infill wells that were diagonally across, which was you know, a good one for the client. And even within about, still about a year, almost, well, not a year, but about half a year later, you still see that we're able to still even maintain and see the production um, stay, stay uh, put for the most part. And then this is just looking at the results, you know, just on a different chart, but we are seeing on average about 118% production uplift for all the parent wells, you know, which was a good deal for the client. They were happy to see that they didn't suffer any loss, unlike in the past where, you know, they'd be able to, they'd see an issue or see production loss with the production. Another thing here too was to also see how are the infill wells doing Remember I said that we found out that on average in most unconventional reservoirs in the U.S., about 40% of the, about 40 of the infill wells do not do, produce up to par with their counterparts, with their uh, comparable parent well. So here we're able to look at part one. Part one was where we were able to do the real-time monitoring with the parent offset well that was, that, that was uh, parallel across, and part two was also on the other side of the of pad one, but I'm just showing the results of the cumulative oil production at about almost a year, and you can see that compared to the per offset well, um, this is similar completion design, everything that the pad one only had only performed about 10% less than the parent well. So with us using the near world well diverter, using the far field diverter, that really helped in ensuring that we keep the infill well production up to par with the parent offset. And then for parent well, for part number two, it did 18% less than the parent well. But there were some other offset wells that were not the client's wells that were around part well number two that we had really no control of. So this was very, very good results for the client. They were very happy to see um, that they were able to, um, to maintain in fact, supersede their offset well production, parent well production, and then maintain infill well production. So I just want to highlight again, you know, these are the key solutions that we used to be able to achieve and mitigate well interference between the parent well and the infill wells, and we're able to also maintain production within reasonable expectations of what we'd expect based on the reservoir production performance or reservoir po production potential of the reservoir. So this pretty much um, rounds up my presentation, but I also want to state that um, for this project too, that the client also saved about $5 million on clean out costs. So all their objectives were met and, and um, they're pretty happy and we're trying to do this for other clients to other operators. So if you're interested, you could definitely reach out to me, you know, but I'm willing to take any questions that you may have.
Well, okay, what we've seen on, on some operators that they're frack protecting those parent wells. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're going in and actually refracking mm -hmm. the parent wells during this infill mm -hmm. program. And maybe they're injecting 100 to 200,000 barrels of water, mm -hmm. fresh water typically, mm -hmm. into the lateral itself. Have you done any comparisons to see if diverters are better or just frack protecting the well? Right, that, right, that's a very good question, Bill, because actually the client had tried frack protecting the well before by injecting fluid, and it didn't work. They were still having uh, to clean out the well bores. Um, they had tried that before they approached us, you know, to be able to deploy the diverter. So in this case, we didn't even need to, the client didn't even need to um, pump any uh, fluid to pressure up the reservoir, you know, before we came up, before we deployed the uh, near wall bore and fat fluid diverters. But that being said, it also depends on where you are. We also have cases in other basins where we've used both together, where the clients would charge up the reservoir with fluid, 100, 200,000 barrels of fluid, you know, to, frack, to protect the parent well, and then we would still pump the near wall bore and fat fluid diverters on the infill well. So it depends on the reservoir. Depends on the severity. Just like you know, I've shown in the plot, there are some basins that are more severe than others when it comes to negative frack hits. So sometimes clients would combine different um, um, different approaches, right, to ensure that you know we're able to mitigate the well interference. Well, thank you very much. You left us with some very valuable information. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you.